it's thick. If this were the only reason, it would be completely inadequate. You ask people sometimes, why, why are you a member of this church? Well, my parents were, or my grandparents were, or our whole family has always been a member of this church, and so that's why. Now, if that's the only reason that you find yourself being a Christian today, that's not really an adequate answer. That's not going to be a good answer before God. Why did you choose to be one of my children? One of my parents were. I just figured I would. But you know, we, we have to be individuals in this thing. We can't be a family. We can't be a mom, dad, and kids going to heaven together. Every one of the family has a responsibility to God individually, even though they are a physical family. I can't answer for Stephanie. She can't answer for me or Stephen or Lacey or Talon or Drew or Brooke or all five grandkids. I can't answer for them. They have to answer for themselves. They're individual Christians. And they have to make that choice. I'm going to be a Christian because. And then they have to decide what their reason is that has motivated them to become a Christian. There are many people who cannot claim this as a reason for their faith. Not everyone was fortunate enough to be raised in a Christian home, were they? And some of you might be able to identify with that. They, later on in life, you ran into someone who was a Christian and they taught you the gospel. And you was able to learn about what it means to become a Christian and to serve God. And so that was the reason that you are a Christian today, or maybe one of the many reasons that you are. And I already made this statement. It can't be dismissed that I'm a Christian today because my parents install, instilled in me a love for God and His Word. Proverbs 22, verse 6, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I can still remember things that mom and dad taught me that were very, very emphatically put to me. <laughs> you know, there was no question about what they were trying to tell me when they said these things. Those things stick with you. 
And a lot of those things pertain to my relationship with God. Those things that they put out there in Friday. Look, this isn't a this isn't a yes or no black and white thing. This is how it is. This is how it is. And this is the way it has to be. And if it's not this way, then this is what's going to happen. They made it just as plain and simple as they possibly could because I needed to understand. You know, sometimes as we teach people, we fail to do that. We fail to make it so plain and simple that they have, don't have any misunderstandings about what it is to become a Christian or to be a Christian and why it's so important to be a Christian. Christianity is a taught religion. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, for faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And, if, and I happen to be have been taught by my parents. And so look at Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, just like Timothy, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dealt in your grandmother Lois, and in your mother Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well. So we see there even a biblical example of someone who was taught by their parents. And look what a great man Timothy turned out to be. He was a great companion of Paul a great preacher of the gospel, and a great example to the early church as he was a young man in the faith. And so it's important as parents, as we as parents, do our best to make sure our children are taught what it is to be a Christian. And then as we teach them, we show them by example how to be a Christian, a faithful Christian. If you have children, you want them to be Christians. Then you teach them to be Christians. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You know, it is possible to create anger in your children if you're teaching them the gospel. You've got to do it with kindness, and they've got to know that you're doing it because you love them, and you sincerely care about them. More than just them, their soul how important that soul is to you and also how important it is to God and how important it also ought to be to them. If you get those things across, then you're on the right track. But that's tough. It's not always easy to do. I know parents who say, where did I fail? Well, you know, maybe you didn't. Maybe you've done all that you could do. But they have decided that's just not what they want to be as a Christian. What can you do about that? Continue to love them. Continue to show them how you are a Christian and a faithful Christian. And just do the best you can with God's help. I'm a Christian because of the evidence. The evidence is overwhelming uh, for the existence of God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. We talked in our Bible class this morning, we was talking about uh, believing in the existence of God. And how that we know that faith and evidence cannot be separated. Think about it. Faith and evidence cannot be separated. Now, I, I made this illustration, like, um, I forget which one of the students I used, but they were sitting there, and I said, oh, I think it was Francie, I said. There was a bottle of water there, and her phone was laying there, and, and she was sitting there. And I said, now, to see, say, Francie is sitting there, it's not faith, because we can see her. I, our eyes can see her. You don't have to have faith to use her. You can see her. You don't have to have faith in that. But if she would get up and go out of the room, and some of us didn't know, she left, but then I say, Francie was sitting there. What's the proof? Her bottle of water, her phone, and the things that belong to her are, are there, which is evidence she was there. So you see how that works with faith and evidence? They go hand in hand. So here we have a verse in the Bible that tells us about all the evidences that we have that there's a God. Well, what are those evidences? Well, look outside. Just for beginners. Look at this human body that God has created and all the complicated things that are in there that man still hasn't figured out. That still work right and still function and still get you know, us going the way we need to go. It's amazing. Evidence, right? Do we see God? We can't see 
him physically. He's a spiritual being. We do believe there's a God. Yeah. What do you base that upon? The evidence that you that you see is your faith in God. I'm a Christian because of the evidence. And the evidence that the Bible is God's word, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that proclaims it himself, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work is equally convincing. It claims itself to be the word of God. We have unfortunately been told that faith and evidence have nothing to do with one another, but God disagrees. Now listen to this. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now all the things I just said a minute ago about evidence and faith, where is it found? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, proof text. It does go together. Faith and evidence go together. I am a Christian because I don't want to go to hell. Everybody you talk to that has any uh, recollection of heaven and hell will make that statement. I don't want to, I want to be a Christian because I don't want to go to hell. Is that sufficient enough? Fear. Is fear a motivator of our faith? Absolutely. Should it be the only motivator of our faith? No. You see, but it is a fear is a motivator of our faith. When I was baptized into Christ, my primary motivation was fear. I can remember. I was about 11 years old, and I thought, because the preacher kept telling us, look, if you know the difference between right and wrong, you understand that Jesus died on the cross for you, you know that if you would die, that you would be lost into an eternal hell because you haven't had your sins washed away that you know you had, that you know are, different, are against God, and that you know are wrong, and you believe all these other things, you're going to lose your soul. That scared me. As a kid, that's right. Then he goes to the illustration, you know, the, about striking a match and burning your finger and how bad it feels when you burn your finger. A few years ago, I don't know if y'all remember or not, I was working over it doing some work over on the east side. And I was stripping a floor. And I was I ran out of stripper, and so I went into the, the supply room to get more stripper, and I set the thing up on a table and was pull, pulling it over and pouring it into a container, which I'd done a hundred times. The spout on the thing was defective, and it broke, and that stripper went shoo, right down my front. I had a T-shirt on and I had jeans on, but it soaked through. And pure stripper will burn you. I mean, it just, I went in the bathroom, I took my stuff off, started rinsing and rinsing and rinsing. I ran home, took a shower, started rinsing and rinsing and rinsing, and the burn was still there. I drove myself to Fairmont General. They stripped me down and started hosing me with a hose. And it still burned. I ended up in Pittsburgh for two days at the burn center. I don't know if y'all remember that. I know what it feels like to burn. And I can't even imagine my whole body being engulfed in that burning and never go away for eternity. Yeah, fear should be a motivator. I was terrified at the prospect of spending an eternity in hell. Many might say that's an improper motivation. However, the psalmist says, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So the Bible even says fear is a good thing. You know, I, I love my dad to death, but I had a fear in my heart for that man at times. But it was not a fear of resentment or hatred. It was a fear of respect fear that I knew he was the boss and I had to listen. Where else? Same way with God. I've got a fear of God. He's the man in charge. And I've got to respect that. And i got to do the best I can to obey him. Where else? Right? 
Fear shouldn't remain our primary motivation, but when a person learns he has sinned and deserves to spend eternity in hell, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, he ought to be afraid. If you're not afraid of losing your soul and going to eternal hell, then where is the beginning of your motivation not to? don't seem to care. Have you ever had someone say, I don't care if I go to hell or not? They have no clue what they just said. They have no idea what they just said. But they wouldn't make that statement. A non-Christian ought to be terrified when he reads in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you become a Christian? You obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you become a Christian. I am a Christian because I obey the gospel of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it might have been the beginning of that was fear. I don't want to lose my soul in an eternal hell. I am a Christian because I want to go to heaven. Now, here's the positive side of it, isn't it? That was the negative side. Here's the positive side. Salvation is one of the greatest motivations. Preparation, though, is needed. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to prepare to go there. And we've got to make sacrifices. We've got to make commitments. We've got to be disciplined. I mean, there's a lot of things that go along with that. But is it worth it? Is it going to be worth it? Absolutely. In comparison to what we just looked at, absolutely. Not just salvation from hell, but salvation to heaven. That wasn't that a different way of looking at it. I get to be saved in heaven. Jesus Christ is the way to heaven. In John 14, and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So we want to be saved in heaven. Why is it do we want to go to heaven? Is it because of all the wonderful things there that's in heaven? Because God is there. Jesus is there. Because there's no tears there. There's no death there. I mean, all the things that the book of Revelation has prophesied that is not there. And we get to go there. Or is it because we are absolutely terrified of going to the other place? Which one is going to be the strongest motivator of you being the Christian you ought to be? The fear of going to hell or the excitement of going to heaven? He is the only way, Jesus Christ. I want to spend eternity in heaven. Not because of what will be there, but because of who will be there. Have you had loved ones go on before that were faithful Christians? Isn't that a motivator in itself? I want to see them again. I want to see them again. So I'm going to do everything in my power to get to go to heaven because I know they're there. They lived the life. They made the sacrifices. They were disciplined. They were faithful Christians, and I wish I was more like them. And I know they're there. So we're doing everything we can to possibly get there, too, because we want to see them again. I want to go to heaven because that's where my Lord is. I want to see Jesus. I want to see God. I want to spend all my days, all of my eternity, just worshiping and praising and singing If you don't like church, you're not going to like heaven. Because <laughs> church is the next best thing to heaven, right? Here we are with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ who are dedicated to service to the Lord, who want to go to heaven too. So in this right next to heaven being here, how many of us have to fight temptation when we're in church? We don't. Will there be temptation in heaven? <laughs> no. 
you're with people who love you and that you love and that you have pleasure being around. It's just a wonderful thing. So if you love church, you're going to really love heaven. It's also the place where all faithful Christians will go and I will be in good company. If you go to heaven, you're going to be in good company. I am a Christian because I love God. Over the years, my love for God grows stronger and stronger, but it's always been at the core of why I'm a Christian. And that should be the core, isn't it? Of why we're Christians, because of our love for God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's the first commandment, to love God. Is love a great motivator? Will love make you do things that you just didn't think it was able, possible to do it any other time when you thought about it? Will love cause you to accept people whom you wouldn't normally accept? Would love cause you to tolerate people whom you wouldn't tolerate? Will love allow you to love people? Love is one of the greatest passions that man has. One of the greatest emotions that man has. One of the strongest emotions that it will drive you to do things you just never thought possible. Until you're in the situation. You see other people experiencing things and you say, how did they get through that? Love got them through it. Love for God. Love for man. Because what's the second commandment? First one's to love God. And the second one is like unto it to love your neighbor as yourself. How could you not love a God who would send his son to die so you could live? John 3, 16, we all know what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son to die for us. His only son to die for us. Because Adam and Eve couldn't obey one command. You say, man, I wish I was Adam and Eve. I only had one thing I couldn't do. You think we could do it? Satan's pretty powerful in his temptations, ain't he? Oh, look at that fruit. Look how good it looks. It's going to it really it'll taste good. And, and when you eat that, you're going to be just as wise as God, knowing good from evil. Boy, he was pretty trickery, wasn't he? Why is this God? Can you imagine? And when they ate, their eyes were open. And they didn't know right from wrong, and they knew they did wrong. They knew they were naked. Started to hide themselves. First John 4 and verse 10 says, This in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Who loved who first? God loved us first. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet his enemies. There's a great demonstration on how to love your enemies. God created us in his image to serve him and praise him and honor him and to give our life solely to him and we turned our back on him. And he didn't give up on us. He said, well, we'll have to come up with a plan then to redeem man back to God. And you know what my plan is? My perfect, my only perfect son without blemish has to die. For the people whom I created that couldn't stay faithful to me. And so he did. And so his son died. Because he loved us so. Why did my Savior come to earth? Because he loved me so. So what should be a great motivation of why I am a Christian? Because I love God. Do you hurt the people you love? Do you hurt your children? Did I do anything to hurt one of my kids on purpose? 
when I avoid even doing something accidentally to hurt them? Do I take precaution that I don't do something to hurt them in, in situations where something could happen? Do I look ahead and, and try to be careful what I'm doing? Absolutely, we do that because as parents, we love our kids. How much do you love God? Would you do anything to hurt him? Do you take precautions when you see situations getting tough so that you won't hurt God? I didn't want to, one of the things I didn't want to do was hurt my dad. Look in his eyes of disappointment killed me. I didn't want to see that was a disappointing eyes looking at me. I did on occasion. And I didn't like it. So I did everything in my power not to have those disappointed eyes look at me. Do you know when we sin and we don't do the right thing, we got disappointing eyes looking at us. And it doesn't matter these physical people, your mom, your dad, Grandpa, Grandpa, it's the disappointing eyes that are coming down from up above that really just bother us. God's disappointed in us. I love God because he loved me first. I am a Christian because Christianity works. The Christian life is the only life that works. The world tries to make it work without Christ, but ultimately it's a great failure. In fact, every formula and plan of God works it's evidence that it does look at the christians you know and look at their lives and the things they've got and and how they live and all the blessings and it's just crazy it works we just got to remember that when i see non-christians stuck in a cycle a cycle of self-destructive behavior i want to ask how is that life working for you huh how's that working for you who do you turn to when things get tough who do you rely on when things are more than you can handle who do we rely on? We rely on God. And then if we are Christians, we know the power of prayer. We may, <clears throat> we see many heading for destruction who will not listen. We just wait for their disaster and think, I told you so. I've been trying to tell you all your life, you need God in your life. I've told you over and over. If you just put God in your life, things will be so much better for you. And the trials and the troubles won't be as hard on you. We've tried to tell them. Even tell them the story of the wise and the foolish man. The wise man built his house on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. Where the storms come and the winds blow and all that happens, you stand firm because of where your foundation is on Jesus Christ. But the people in the world build their house on sand. On the easiest, they go the easy direction, right? Isn't that what it was? In the plains of Jordan. Now the plains of the Jordan River would flood and it would just flood immensely. But along the Jordan River, the, the, the sand and the earth was so easy to move and to move around and create a foundation to build a house on. Oh, and it was fine as long as the floods didn't come. But what happened when the Jordan flooded? Those houses were washed away because they were founded upon sand. There was no rock there to hold them stable. When a person actually lives out the principles of Christianity, they have an abundant life. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I come that they might have life and have it abundantly. Do you like abundance of good things we do don't we if something's good we like to have an abundance of those good things and so why wouldn't we want to have an abundant life i am a christian because christianity works and i have an abundant life in jesus christ what a motivator great motivator that doesn't mean that it's a life free from storms but it is the only life that gives you peace in the midst of storms. And there's the story I just told you in Matthew chapter 7, 24 through 27, about the wise and the foolish man. I am a Christian because it gives me a purpose. People in the world are always asking, what's my purpose? Why am I here? 
Feel sorry for someone who has to ask that question. In Romans chapter 14 and verse 7, for not one of us lives for himself and not one of us dies for himself. I have found my purpose. My purpose is to bring glory to my Father in heaven or my Heavenly Father. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. You know, I've never really pinpointed this, <clears throat> this verse for you before, but isn't it true that everything we do, we should do to the glory of God? Whether it be mowing our neighbor's grass, or going and working at the factory, or going the elevator to the last floor on the Empire State Building in your big office that overlooks the city of New York, whatever it is that you do, you do all to the glory of God. And if we do that, we'll do it right. Whatever it is we're doing. Because we're doing to bring glory to God. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Bring glory to your Father which is in heaven. So whatever you do, if you do to the glory of God, you're letting your light shine. And that gives me purpose. Doesn't that give you purpose? Absolutely gives you purpose. What is my reason for doing everything I do to the glory of God? And my purpose is to bring glory to God. And to let my example be seen. So that others may see that light and be attracted to that light. And also become a Christian. Being a child of God gives me a reason to get out of bed in the mornings. Sometimes we need a reason, don't we? Life's tough. We know the day's going to be hard. There's so many things i got to do, so many things i got to face, so many decisions got to be made. How do I get out of this bed this morning? Because i got a purpose. I've got a purpose in life. That's why I get up. The obstacles are there for me to overcome. The obstacles are there to make me stronger. That's why I'm getting up. I've got a purpose don't have a purpose, then you stay there. You wallow in self-pity. You lay there in the ashes and you cry out for help. And no one hears. It gives me a mission. If God did not exist, if heaven were a fairy tale, and if Jesus hadn't died for our sins, there would be absolutely no purpose in life. As it is, there is something inside of each, each of us that longs for significance, purpose, and meaning. Evidence that there is more to the world than just this old physical world. If this is all we've got, we don't have much. Some people think that it's wonderful. All these material things are the greatest thing ever. But you buy the new car, 10, 15 years, the car is old. Take it, sell it, and get rid of it. It's old. It goes away. But you know, when you get it, that soul in God's grace, by becoming a Christian, it just gets stronger every day. It gets more alive every day. It gets more vibrant every day. It gives you excitement in life. It gives you purpose in life. And that's what we need. We need a purpose. Being a Christian is the only thing that gives this life any meaning at all. Have you ever thought what your life would be without God? Is it hard to imagine a life without God now that you've found it? I've never known that. Some of the greatest preachers live their life without God before they become, pre before they become a preacher, and they can really relate to that. I've always had God in my life. I don't know what it's like to be without God. I can't imagine not being able to lay my head down on the pillow at night and close my eyes and thank God for all the blessings of life and thank Him for sending His Son, thank Him for forgiving my sins, thank Him for my family, thank Him for everything I got. So I don't have God, so what do I do when I lay my head down on the pillow? I start thinking about what i got to do tomorrow. 
how miserable the day has been and how miserable tomorrow is going to be. There's a big difference in those two scenarios, ain't there? I got purpose. I'm going to wake up in the morning. I'm going to hit my feet on the move. I'm going to eat the food that God has provided for me for breakfast. I'm going to use the energy that he gave me to do my exercises. I'm going to put the clothes on that he provided for me to wear. And I'm going to go to my job with the talents that he gave me to use. What if you don't have God? What about all that? You just take it for granted. There's no thankfulness. There's no appreciation. You just use it or abuse it and go on. But how much more purpose do you got when you realize just where it all came from? And why you got it? I'm sure that we can come up with many other reasons for why you or I have become Christians. As I was studying this lesson, there's a lot of these applied to me. And I'm sure a lot of them apply to you. This is a subject that we need to consider daily in our lives and in our minds. Wake up in the morning and remind yourself why I am a Christian and see if it doesn't make your day better. Reminding yourself why you serve God and the many reasons why you serve God. By doing so, we will keep the focus upon Christ, God, heaven, and faith in our lives. And isn't that what we got to do? we got to stay focused. Stay focused. You ever try to do something when someone's distracting you? I don't do very well. It's hard to stay focused when i got outside interference. But you gotta, if you want to get accomplished, you got to stay focused. Like the athletes, they hear the crowd screaming. But they can't. they got to put it out of, their, out of them. You gotta stay focused. Campfire when I was a camp. <laughs> I was doing the devotion at campfire. And I come out and I started off and say, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Wah! This baby over here that this chaperone had, I mean, just was screaming at the top of her lungs. And so I turned up the volume. Then this whippoorwill comes in the tree just above my head. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill, just like crying out at the top of his lungs. And i got to stay focused. I've got a devotion to give to these 7 to 11-year-olds to wrap up the week on Thursday night about everything they've talked about all week, trying to finalize it all. But you see, we've got to stay focused. No matter what the distraction, a crying baby, a whippoorwill, trials and tribulations in life, whatever it is that tries to distract you, you just got to stay focused. Are you a Christian? If not, why not become one? Here's God's plan for us. Hear God's word. You believe in Jesus Christ, as we looked in John 3.16. You repent of your sins. You're ready to turn your life around to a life of service to God and worshiping God and praising God and all the rest of your days. You'll, plan, you'll stand before this audience to make the great confession you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Be buried in the waters of baptism where you know your sins will be washed away. You know that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. And we live faithful to death. As it says in Revelation 2.10, that we may receive that crown of life. If you're here this morning and not a Christian, or this evening and not a Christian, why not become one? Or if you're here this evening and you are a Christian, but you've lost focus, why not get refocused? And remember why it is to become a Christian in the first place. And get back on track. If you're here tonight, you need to respond to 